Isn't that cool to be a church like that? When we started Phos, which means light, the Greek, Greek word for light, we ripped off a saying from a, from a Catholic group of priests known as the Christophers. Their motto was, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. And Phos has kind of stood on that ground the whole time. And we're, we're way more about lighting candles than cursing the darkness. There's too much darkness to curse. We ain't got enough cursing to go around for all the darkness. But we can light a candle in the middle of the darkness. And guess what? Where every eye turns to the light, right? A little light in a big dark room draws all the attention. And that's what we want to do. We want to put all the focus on Jesus, on what he's about. And so we don't have to trample on a lot of stuff. We just have to hold up a light. So thanks for being the church that does that. Thanks for being people that do that. You know, Jesus said that his followers would be salt and light, that we would, we would live in a different way. And so I invite you into considering doing that today. And I want to go ahead and frame this message up with the words of Jesus. And the very first public message that we have record of, when Jesus stood to, to speak, he quoted from the book of Isaiah, from the Old Testament passage. And he said, he basically said this. He said, I've come to set the captives free. And elsewhere in John 10, 10, Jesus said, there's a thief that comes to steal and to kill and destroy, but I've come to give you life, a great big, wide open, new kind of life with God, an eternal life. And so I want to go ahead and frame my comments today, what I'm going to get into in the message in a few minutes around that. My mission for you, my mission, my hope as your pastor is that you live at the highest level possible, that you shine the brightest light possible, that you are the most free people possible living at the highest level possible, that you don't let anything get between you and the eternal life that Jesus has in mind for you. And I'm not just talking about life when you're dead. I'm talking about living right now at the optimal level. Make sense? So today, if I get on your shoes, I'm not trying to mess up the shine. But where the shoe fits, you probably need to wear it, take some action, because imagine that in some ways, I'm going to be telling you that the road up ahead, there's a, you're on this giant highway headed through life, and I'm going to tell you that there is a place up ahead where the bridge is out. So imagine me standing in the road, trying to get your attention, saying, slow down, stop, go a different way, because the bridge is out. Now, I'm not telling you that because I'm mad at you. I'm, you're going to seem mad, but I'm not telling you because I'm mad. I'm telling you because you're going to die. You're going to live less than you could if you continue down this path. Does that make sense? So just... Take that for what it's worth. You'll understand more later when we get to those parts of the message. So just imagine, I'm standing in the middle of the road. I'm trying to get your attention. I'm trying to tell you. And if the shoe fits, wear it. Or if you need to slow down, if you need to take a detour, then let's do those things. Okay? So let me pray, and then we'll go into the message. Father, thanks so much for a chance to be with these people who I love so much. And I know you love them more than I do. That you care for them more than I do. That you have plans and purposes for their life far beyond what they've even imagined. Now, God, I pray that you call every single person here today into the full, meaningful, powerful, purposeful, productive life that you have imagined for them, you created them for. Help us all to take a step toward following Jesus into that sort of life today. That's what I'm asking for in Jesus' name. Amen. So between where we are today and where we, where we would like to go in life, there are things that can trip us up. Carrie Newhoff wrote a book called Didn't See It Coming about things that can trip us up on our journey through life, things that can slow us down or derail us or stop us. In this, in, the, in this chapter I'm covering this week, it's called When All Your Dreams Come True. You see, sometimes all of your dreams come true, and then it's still not enough. It's like standing on the pinnacle of a great mountain you've chosen to climb and realize there's nothing around me but thin air. I'm here all alone. When all of your dreams come true, sometimes it's just, just not enough. Carrie says this, the emptiness that so many people experience in life is more intense in success than it is in failure. Now, I'd like to try that on for a while. I'd like to see, you know, what that's like, how, that kind of success. Um, but I have had enough success to know that it's never really kind of enough, is it? There's always more. There's always more. We always compare ourselves with someone who has more. Rarely do we turn around and look at all the people that have less or that aren't as successful, however you deem success, most of the time, we're looking out in front of us, someone with a higher batting average, someone who throws the ball farther, someone who can, who can kick the ball farther when you're a little kid, someone, someone who's more popular in today's terms, has more likes on Facebook, whatever it is, but there's always someone ahead of us. But sometimes you realize you turn around and you look behind you and say, man, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, comparison games don't work out so well. They can leave us feeling really empty. 
And success, when you reach the pinnacle, it can leave you feeling empty. You know, one of the ideas of case studies and emptiness, the, the first one that came to mind for me was a guy named Robin Williams. Great actor. Do you remember Robin Williams? I loved that guy. Good morning, Vietnam, right? Yeah? What else? What other movies was he in? Patch Adams. Aladdin. Oh, he's fantastic in Aladdin. Say again. Mork and Mindy, way back in the day. Yeah. Mrs. Doubtfire, Goodwill Hunting. Dead, oh man. Dead Poet Society, classic, classic work. Carpe diem. I mean, just powerful, powerful stuff. I loved him as an actor. I thought, man, what a talented human being. And in the world's terms, he had everything, right? Money and fame and popularity and fortune and, and just everything smiled on him. And yet at the end, do you remember what happened? He committed suicide. How can you be that successful, that eminently popular, and yet wind up with a firm grasp on an empty sack and choose to kill yourself? How can that be? What is that about? That the pinnacle of success can lead to nothingness. We even see it in, in Disney cartoon people like Ariel. Remember when she starts, her, she's in her little song, she says, I got gadgets and gizmos aplenty. I got who's it's and what's it galore. <laughs> but who cares? No big deal. I want more. <laughs> <laughs> Something exactly not like that. Okay. Um, but she wants more. But then, then there's the, um, the deal of the, uh, of, of the la- this, one of these latest movies last year, The Greatest Showman. Of course, there's different songs in there, but then there's this tremendous singer from Europe, and she's singing, and she's on stage, and she starts her rendition. What, what is her song? What's it about? She says, basically, it's never enough. The whole, the whole song, the soaring rendition at the end, it's never enough. Never, never, never enough, never enough. I mean, she's all up there like that, only, like, kind of like that. She's not as good as I am, but it's okay. okay. <laughs> but but still, it's, there's just never enough. She, she's singing about there's never enough. And most of us in our life, we feel like, man, there's just never enough. There's never enough. There's always more. There's always somewhere I'm going. There's always more that, that I want to get into. In ancient times, there were people just like that too. There was a king named Solomon who was perhaps the wealthiest person of all time and one of the wisest persons of all time. And he wrote a book. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote a some testament of, of his life in a, in a book in the Old Testament called Ecclesiastes. And he chronicles his journey of more. He chronicles how he had a quest for more and, how, and where that quest led him. Now, just to give you a little context, he was so wealthy that people would bring him all kinds of tribute, all kinds of things you owe to a king, taxes and tribute. He had exotic animals brought to him from all over the world, apes from far off regions and all kinds of exotic birds and, and tons of of silver, literally, literally, tons of silver, tons and tons of gold, a billion dollars a year at least brought to him in tribute, and he reigned for 40 years. So it's probably worth at least $40 billion, if not more, when you compile all the wealth he had. Matter of fact, he had so much silver, he owned so much silver, that silver was actually devalued in that region because he owned it all. He had it all. All of his goblets, all of the cups in his house were all made of gold. And men, this will freak you out, 300 wives. I have one, and it's about to kill me. 300? Are you kidding? 700 concubines? Now, this is going to make a lot of you women really mad. This is a cultural, it's not, and, and although it's written about in the Bible, this is not suggested behavior, okay? This is not the way to live. In real terms, in the way the culture ran then, Solomon owned a thousand women. <laughs> Gary's freaked out already. Okay. He owned a thousand women. That means anything he wanted, he got. Any way he wanted it, he got all the time. This guy is off the chart, off the chain. In terms of what many people would deem success, He's at the pinnacle of the pinnacle. He's far beyond what most of us would ever imagine. So he's a case study in this idea of what happens when you reach the pinnacle. So let's see 
what he has to say about this. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, picking up with verse 2, he says this, absolute futility, says the teacher, absolute futility, everything is futile. What does a man gain for all of his efforts that he labors at under the sun? A generation comes and a generation goes. The sun rises and the sun sets. It returns to its place where it rises, gusting to the south, turning to the north, turning, turning, goes the wind, and the wind returns in its cycles. All the streams flow to the sea, yet the sea is never full. The streams are flowing to the place, and they flow there again. All things are wearisome. Man is unable to speak. The eye is not satisfied by seeing or the ear filled with hearing. I applied my mind to seek and explore through wisdom all that is done under heaven. God has given people this miserable task to keep them occupied. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun and have found everything to be futile, a pursuit of the wind. Can you imagine having that much wealth, that much power, that much control, that much credited to you of being wise and being wealthy and coming to the end of all that and in the middle of all that saying, this is all just futile. There's, this is really nothing here. I'm at the top of this mountain and there's nothing but thin air. There's nothing here. I'm still empty. It's never enough. In the book of, of Ecclesiastes, Solomon kind of chronicles his journey. And I'll call this journey his Solomon pattern for handling emptiness. And the Solomon pattern is basically about self-medication. It's about how to, how to medicate your own pain, how to try to fill your own am- emptiness. And it's all about different kinds of medication that he applied to his pain. And we do the same thing. But listen to some of these things that he tried to fill up the pain in his life. Uh, in Ecclesiastes 2, beginning at verse 4, he says this, I increased my achievements. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself and planted every kind of fruit tree in them. I constructed reservoirs of water for myself from which to irrigate a grove of flourishing trees. I acquired male and female servants and had slaves who were born in my house. I also owned many herds of cattle and flocks, more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. I also amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I gathered male and female singers for myself and many concubines and the delights of men. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also remained with me. All that my eyes desired, I did not deny them. I did not refuse myself any pleasure, for I took pleasure in all my struggles. This was my reward for all of those struggles. When I considered all that I had accomplished and what I had labored to achieve, I found everything to be futile and a pursuit of the wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. Kerry Newhoff says, he got to the very top and it was empty. Hmm. Solomon had access to tons of wealth, fortune, fame. We, we do too. Here in the United States, today in our economy and in our environment and with with the internet, we have more access to more things than anybody in history. There's probably nothing that you really wanted that you couldn't get your hands on if you wanted it bad enough. If you're willing to sacrifice enough for it or pay enough for it, there's almost, there's probably nothing that would exceed your grasp today. You could have anything you wanted, any kind of success you wanted, any kind of fame or fortune, you could probably get there if you worked hard enough for it and and worked the, the system the right way. There's so much available to us now than more than ever. And yet the same path that Solomon went down is the same path many of us in the United States are going down. One of Solomon's pathways was partying. It was like he he just talks about it in in Ecclesiastes. I encourage you to read that book this week. He just said, I'm just going to party my way. I'm going to party my way through this. I'm going to medicate my pain. I'm going to fill up this emptiness by just partying. And and part of that partying was, I'll just call it chemical X. He filled up his life with with chemicals and, and stuff. You know, and today there's all different kinds of names for things we have opioids and we have alcohol and we have all these different stuff, heroin, that we can, we can all participate in and, and, and try to find our satisfaction in something that will fill our soul, that will fill up our emptiness. Probably the, the classic drug, drug of choice in America is still alcohol. Um, it's still there and, and, and this is where I'm going to stand in the middle of the road and I'm going to yell at you just a little bit because I love you. But I'm going to tell you, 
if that's your path, whatever chemical you're using, the bridge is out ahead. This will destroy your life. I know you can say, well, it's just, it's just X. You, this is where it starts. It's just X. It's just this. It's okay. It's okay because da 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 and you're giving me excuses. I wish you could sit in my seat for a week and you would change your mind. Last Tuesday night, I get a frantic call from somebody in our church. And someone who I love, who I care about a whole lot, who struggles with alcohol, had posted online a picture, and the picture was this. It's a picture of a big Jack Daniels bottle, and beside it is a pistol. Caption, one of these is going to get me tonight. So until 1 a.m., I'm dealing with that. And then the rest of the week, many more times. Well, this person teeters between life and death. And it's because he chose alcohol as a pathway. I'm going to tell you, alcohol is a dead-end street. It ends in nowhere. And I got personal stories. I got a brother-in-law who died at about 43, 44 because of alcohol. In addition to dying young, he left his children devastated. My niece is in prison right now, a heroin addict, largely because her father was addicted to alcohol, who never paid any attention to her, who never gave her any credence or any, any, anything her whole life. So she wrestles with addiction because, in my opinion, of his addiction. So my point is, there's a better path. Giving your life over to any kind of chemical leads to a bad place. Scripture's clear, we should only be ruled by the Holy Spirit. Here's your test. If you think it's no big deal that you're not controlled by the chemical, then just give it up. Just give it up. Just stop. Cold turkey right now, today, stop. And if you can stop and stay stopped, then it's not, it doesn't own you. But if you can't give it up, chances are it's growing tentacles into your life and it will, in time, destroy you. And it will destroy your family. And it will take away the joy of your future. And it's not God's will. That's your choice. You're making a choice. So you choose and choose wisely. In addition to those things I've just mentioned, I have, we have a beautiful couple in our family. We've loved them dearly. Gone through a tragic divorce. Our nephews and nieces are in harm's way because of alcoholism. So please don't come to me and say, it's okay, it's not okay not okay. Choose wisely. And it could be whatever other chemical you want. Insert chemical X in whatever your drug of choice is. It could be sleeping pills. It could be, it could be all kinds of other things, prescription medi- medications. You got to choose, friends. You got to choose. Now, this isn't mad preacher. This isn't bad you. It's not that. I'm just telling you, the road is out ahead. The road is out ahead. Choose wisely. Choose carefully what you're going to give control of your life to. Does this make sense? Please give control of your life to the Holy Spirit and to the work of Jesus in your life and not to anything less because living any, anywhere less is called sin. And it's not sin because God's mad at you. It's sin because God designed you for more. Do you know this? If you have children, you understand what I'm talking about. You want your children to have a good diet. Why? So they can live at an optimal level, right? If your children wanted to eat gravel... Would you let them? As a parent, you wouldn't. But the reality is that God will let you eat whatever you want, put anything in your body you want to. He's a good father. He's a good parent, but he will let you do what you want to with your life. And you don't have to wait till you're dead to experience hell. Continue to use chemical X as much as you want to excess. Continue to, to let it have tentacles and to grow into your life. And someday there's a good chance that you'll experience hell on earth and you'll inflict it on everybody around you. Words to the wise are sufficient. Do with that information what you want. Then there's not only partying and chemical acts, there's retail therapy. And, and I, I, I don't know about you, but man, I'm looking forward to Black Friday and Cyber Monday as much as any of you. I've got some things on my list that I want. I really, really got to have them. I need them bad. Okay, some of you guys are better at retail therapy than I am, but uh, but we, we get into this idea so much so in America right now. Have you noticed all the storage units that are being built, all the storage unit places that are being that are popping up? There's one just past the McDonald's in Crestwood that's just it's been up for a while. There's some others in the area. Here's a little statistic that you'll find interesting: one in eleven Mar- Americans pays an average of ninety four ninety four dollars and fourteen cents per month to use self storage. 
finding a place for the material overflow of the American dream. According to Sparefoot, a company that tracks the self-storage industry, the United States boasts more than 50,000 facilities and roughly 2.3 billion square feet of rentable space. In other words, the volume of self-storage units in the country could fill the Hoover Dam with old clothing, skis, and keepsakes more than 26 times. How about that for some stuff? We got some serious stuff. I got about half of that at my house. Okay? I mean, so we're trying to get rid of it. If you want some stuff, come on over. I got some stuff you can bring to your house, and then you can rent a storage unit and put it in. Okay? Because I'm not renting a storage unit. But I do need to get rid of some stuff. So if you, got, if you need stuff, talk to me. I got some stuff you can have. Okay? I might even pay you to take some of it. Okay? So, but we got this stuff, I just think, going on, retail therapy. That's one way. And obviously, Solomon talked about that. He had all kinds of retail therapy. He could buy anything he wanted and lots of it which leads to the next way we try to medicate our pain and emptiness is more, better, and different. We don't just have some stuff. We need some more stuff. And then we need that stuff to be better stuff than we had to get rid of the stuff that was okay, but it's obsolete now because of whatever reason. And then, and then we got to get some different stuff to go with the more different, better stuff, right? And we pile up stuff. And we wind up with piles and piles of stuff, whether we need it or not. And, and for a moment, it makes us feel better. Just like the next one, man, is overeating. I mean, right now... We can get all the food we want in America pretty much. And it, we're always at these all-you-can-eat buffet things, like the five ninety nine dollars Ch- Chinese buffet in LaGrange. Like, right? I mean, you can get all you want, all you want, right? Fill that plate up seven times, I think. Julie won't let me go there. But if one of you want to sneak off with me, we can figure it out later. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, I have been doing enough to know that they got those cool little donut things there. You know what I'm talking about? They're like a biscuit covered in sugar. You know what I'm talking about? How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? Give it up. Come on. Be honest. How many of you guys like them? Well, about half of the people. I mean, I love them. So you got to keep me out of the all-you-can-eat buffet zones because it's interesting that Americans, we love our food so much that, that we are, our number one killer of a lot of our diseases turns out to be obesity and the things related to overeating. Kind of crazy, right? That we could eat ourselves to death and that God would let us do it. That's not God's will. That's our choice. God has an optimal will for your life and for my life. And that's what I'm talking to you about. How do you live at the highest level possible? How do you live in the concept of what the Jews called eternal life? When they came and asked Jesus about eternal life, they're not asking him just about what happens when you die. They're saying, how do we live at the optimal level? I'm giving you some optimal living, level, level living ideas here, some things to eliminate from your life or to change your mind about. The, the last one that I want to talk about just for a moment is sex on demand. You don't have to go searching for internet pornography. It's searching for you. It will find you. And if you let it, it will wrap its tentacles around you. It promises something. It's a mirage. It doesn't deliver. And more of that won't help you at all. What we need as humans is a connection to God ultimately and a connection to other people as well. You won't find that or be satisfied in the internet pornography region. It just doesn't happen. It promises that, but it doesn't deliver. It's a firm grasp on an empty sack. It will leave you devastated in the long term. Again, a warning from the middle of the road. Turn back. Make a difference. Make a change. Change your mind. Go a different path. There's a better path of intimacy with someone you love within the bounds of marriage the way God designed it, which is so much healthier for your soul than these cheap substitutes. So... The Solomon path leaves us emptier than we've ever been before. And I know that because of this. We have more wealth in America today than we've ever had more storage units, more stuff, more access to things. And yet, we're an extremely depressed, disconnected society. How could we be more depressed, more disconnected, and more pain than we're seeing in America right now? It's never happened in history that people have been this depressed and this disconnected. And yet, we have access to more and more stuff we've ever had, more, more of these things we've talked about than ever. So how does that work out? Because it's the Solomon path that leads to things being futile and chasing the wind. If you're tired of chasing the wind, there's a better path, and Jesus invites us into a better path, a stronger path. I mentioned this scripture a while ago, John 10.10, 10, Jesus talking about how the, the Solomon path will steal your life. He says, a thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy, to take your optimum life away, to take eternal life away from you. But Jesus says, I've come that you may have life and have it in an abundance, in parentheses, eternal life. I've come. That's why Jesus came, to give you eternal life, optimum life. And then Matthew 11, 28, come to me, all you who labor, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Some of you need rest today. 
from all you've been chasing, from all you've been trying to do on your own, by yourself, self-medicating, trying to figure out how to live life at the optimal level, how to have things not be empty, it's found in Jesus. It's not found anywhere else. Luke 12, Jesus teaching. This is what he has to say. And listen carefully. Imagine Jesus speaking to you right now. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They don't have a storeroom or a barn. And yet God feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than the birds? Can any of you add a cubit to his height by worrying? If then you're not able to do even a little thing, why worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon and all of his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass, which is in the field today and is thrown into the furnace tomorrow, how much more will he do for you? Oh, you have a little faith. Don't keep striving for what you should eat and what you should drink, and don't be anxious. For the Gentile world eagerly seeks all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. The Gentile world, by the way, in this teaching of Jesus, would be those outside of the rule and the reign of God. That would be to be a Gentile, to be away from the rule and the reign of God. To be in eternal life is to be within the range and the rule and the authority of God in your life. That's what eternal life is. And your Father knows you need all these things, but seek His kingdom, and these things will be provided for you. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your Father delights to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Make money bags for yourselves that won't grow old, and an inexhaustible treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So store up treasure in a better place. Make some differences in your path. There is an eternal life, an optimal life ahead of you. You see, eternal life, the, the good life of purpose and power and meaning with Jesus begins now. It begins right now if you choose to. It begins now. When you truly join his mission and make it down here like it is up there. Remember Jesus' prayer. Jesus says that we should learn to pray. And in, his, in the model prayer that Jesus said, he, he said we should pray that God would make things down here like they are up there. That's to participate in the work of God. And that, my friends, is to find a satisfying life, a life of purpose and power and meaning, potential. All that you're looking for is found in trading your little kingdom for his kingdom. All that you're looking for, all this eternal life that you really want, desire, and need is found in Jesus. And we call that eternity. We call that eternal life. Eternal life starts when we start following Jesus. The moment we give up on our little plans and we stop self-medicating and we turn to him. That's where we find life. And today I'm inviting you to consider a life with God. A life in his kingdom and in his reign where you trade in your little things for his big thing. When you let go of these ways of self-medicating and trying to fill up your life and let your life be filled up with God and with Jesus, with Holy Spirit instead. One of my friends sent me a text this week and it said, basically, it said, you know, if Jesus just came so we could get into heaven and avoid hell, then really nothing here on earth matters, right? In one sense, that's kind of true. You have an eternal destiny that trumps anything that's going to happen to you on this planet if you're a follower of Christ. That's true. What's not true is that the only thing that matters is what happens when you die. That wasn't really what Jesus was teaching. That's not what he talked about most of the time. You need to dive into his teaching, take off your old school training from when you were in Sunday school. Jesus wasn't only talking about what happens when you're dead. He's talking about a new way to live, a new way to live under the kingdom and the rule and the authority of God in your life. And that, my friends, is when eternal life begins. Right now, when you start bringing things down here like they are up there, when you start living like his kingdom matters more than your kingdom, then you're entering into eternal life the way Jesus imagined and what he was teaching. So yes, I don't, you, don't, you can live in heaven forever with Jesus. Yes, that's true. But there's more. You can start living today better than you've ever lived by coming under the rule and the reign and the authority of Jesus. 
It's what I'm asking you to consider today. And you can certainly walk out the doors and disregard this. That's your choice. But I would like you to consider, what would it be like if I truly followed Jesus with my whole heart? What would it be like if I gave up these little ways of self-medicating and turned to him and began to pursue a relationship with him? What would it be like in my life? What, my li- what could my life be like? Friends, I've got to tell you, this eternal way of living will lead to a true life bigger and better than you've ever imagined. Yes, here on this planet, and yes, when you die. Both. We need Jesus at the center of our lives. We need his kingdom to be bigger in our minds and our imaginations and our pursuits than our little kingdoms. When those things get in order, then you begin to live in an eternal life way that honors your design, that honors all that God wants to do in you, for you, and through you. So I'm inviting you to consider a higher way, a better way. It might mean a few ways, a few things you need to repent of. It's okay. You can do that. It might mean that even if you've been a Christ follower for a while, you realize, I'm letting some other things get in the way of that. I need to reprioritize God in my life and His mission and purpose in my life. Whatever that is, you make those changes. You step into that today. If you're feeling convicted by this, it's not about what I'm saying. It's about what the Holy Spirit is saying through me to you. You need to listen carefully. If your heart is pricked or pushed or moved today, it's because of God at work. Listen to him. Take action on what he's asking you to do. We're coming to a time of communion when we celebrate and remember the work of Jesus. That Jesus did die on a cross. His body was crushed for us. His blood was poured out to forgive us of our sins. The Holy Spirit's been unleashed to give you power to live in a whole new way. Don't you want to live that way? Under the power and the reign and rule of the, of the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't you like to live that way? Possible. When you come to the tables, you're remembering that's possible. That a whole new way to live by His power is possible. And that's what I'm inviting you to consider today. No matter how broken you've been, no matter what kind of goofy choices you've made in the past, what's really cool is 1 John 1 9 says this if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that's good news, right? So today, let's maybe start fresh. Let's make some new choices. Let's move ahead in a different way by that power. And let's begin to tap into this idea of true eternal life that can start right now. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the work of Jesus in our lives. Thank you for the promise of of a purpose and a power and of a life that's bigger and deeper and stronger than than what we could ever do on our own. Now, God, wherever I'm self-medicating, help me to change out my self-medication for your healing and your hope and your purpose and your power in my life. God, may the Holy Spirit reign and rule in my life more than ever. And and for my friends that are gathered here today, I'm praying for the same thing. They would trade in their little things and the little ways they've been self-medicating for a bigger purpose and a bigger power that's available through you. Today, God, help us to turn our sights toward you, toward what Jesus can do in us and for us and through us by your Spirit unleashed in us. As we come to the tables today, God, Help us to reclaim our birthrights as children of you. Help us to live the way you want us to live, by your power, by your rule, by your authority. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you feel led to come to a communion table, then you do that. Choose any table that makes sense to you. And if you need to sit and rest and just listen to God, then do that too. You do whatever you feel like God is calling you to do right now.